And welcome inside another live edition of the Deep Look Podcast. It's the weekly show about the current state of Ultimate. Alongside Keith Rayner, senior editor, I am the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. The music, not enough for me today. I need, I, I need the beat drop. We never got it. I, I don't know what to do, Keith. How do we continue <laughs> the show at this point? Well, uh, I, I, have, I have some stuff to, to get off my chest uh after oh. the weekend the beginning of march madness uh so yes. uh some some of the some of the the folks who are a member of the uh, degenerate section of our <laughs> discord know exactly where i'm going man it was a tough weekend for betting on march madness legally mm. I, I should say and uh got some real bad beats you know a lot of a lot of missing the cover by a single point uh, including by a meaningless three-pointer by Oakland after sweating out a like this is the third leg of a parlay I never bet parlays it was but it, they had they gave me the promo bonus I bet on it there are there were two <laughs> things I was going to bet about the game anyway so I was like I'll just add a third and then I'll take the bonus and it took a very narrow set of circumstances to have everything to come together for this thing to work and then with like 13 seconds left guy on Oakland just hits a meaningless three and blows my uh blows my under and there it goes. Horrible. That's, that's Horrible. how the cookie Listen, crumbles. I, I, I had a some kind of boost deal that I had a two-team parlay, but like better than the normal spread. So it was like alternate spreads. So I, I'm sitting on an Oregon plus eight and a half ticket in the men's tournament. And uh, I think the line at close was four and a half. So I'm like feeling good. I'm like, I'll hedge if I need to. You know, I can always buy out of this bet and, you know, basically guarantee a small profit. But I'm like, that's plus 200 if I win. I'm feeling great. Oregon is like leading this game most of the way. And then they miss some free throws late and Creighton hits a three and it goes to overtime. And I'm like, all right, I mean, it's still holding an eight and a half ticket here. So no problem. Goes to double overtime, Keith. And then Creighton wins by 13 in double overtime. 13 in a five minute overtime. Disgusting disgusting i mean I, I, I felt that i had the right side and so what are you going to do sometimes it doesn't go your way i had i had dayton plus nine and a half they lose by 10 i had san diego's or south dakota state plus 15 and a half they lose by 17 I also had dayton we nine were both and a half. on grand canyon <laughs> we're both on grand Tough. canyon and they gave up like a 17-4 run to end the game uh or to end like a 10-0 run and absolutely blow it in what it, they could have covered the lot like i had them on the money line and on the spread they could have covered the spread and they just like totally crapped out at the end. I mean, it was, it was a okay. tough weekend. I will listen, go listen, ahead. Go ahead. Talk worse? 
you know what's worse? No, I'm not even going to talk Grand Canyon. I'm going to talk about my bets in the Ultimate Super Contest where I made <laughs> oh. bets on BYU in their two uh, like Friday night opener games against Oregon State and Washington. Keith, you made the lines. You had it at even money. So I'm like, okay, no problem. Uh, BYU, maybe they don't win both of these games, but they're probably going to win one, and I feel like they're probably going to win two. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, they're pretty good, and this is basically their nationals because they're not going to be playing meaningful ultimate after Northwest Challenge. And what do they do, Keith? They go out and they lose each of those games by one goal and basically just nuke me out of the Super Contest. I was Brutal. I was surprised when you put in those those bets because I feel like it was like just two weeks ago you were like oh BYU not impressive like you were watching them play on the stream and you're like they're not impressive they they, they weren't that impressive but I mean they they look I don't know they lose by Carlton to Carlton by two Oregon State by one Washington by one and then the, the rest of their weekend kind of ends up pretty ugly but I don't know I I I thought they were like a Friday night BYU game that's like they're they're like they they get they have some kind of super boost on Friday nights, but not this. Maybe time. they were disappointed by their their Brutal. team's March Madness performance. I was I will say, but I there were there were some nice things during March Madness. It's been a rough March Madness. I will say, uh, Audie Crooks, Iowa State, uh, the big on their team on the in the women's tournament, absolutely yep. dominating a game was one of my highlights. She dropped like. 40 points on like 18 of 20 shooting completely unstoppable just like <laughs> bullying everybody out of the way shooting over three people in the post uh making free throws and then just like sprint so she had she was um, she they played the two three and she was in the in the paint covering the paint and so she would like lay it in on one end and then have to sprint the length of the court the other to go play defense <laughs> block a shot and then sprint the like it was like watching the deep deep in the zone like sky somebody get a block and then sprint deep for the score over and over again and I, I try never to make my deep deep the same person as my primary deep target on offense because i don't want them to have to do all those sprints but uh she went out there and did it and basically never missed i mean it was it was sick and her team came back from 20 they were down 20 to maryland and came back and won that game uh, definitely one of the highlights of, of March Madness for me. Very, very hype. Uh, Rob G asks in the chat, when will betting affect Ultimate the way it has affected other sports? It never never would be good for me. How many ads during an NBA game are for some betting app? Uh, Charlie and I are both better, so like I think we're a little less uh, negative on all the betting, advertising, and stuff around sports, although I do see the potential problems. You know, you're seeing... Players and you know, Shohei Otani right now is to, has some betting clouds around him. There's an NBA player who's being investigated for potentially some suspicious betting patterns, uh, Jonte Porter. Uh, but like, so this stuff I, I get is a problem. It's never going to be a problem for Ultimate. We can't even get places to take bets. We have to make up our own fake betting to bet on Ultimate. Uh, and when there were people who take bets, like it's just the volume so little, it like really doesn't matter there's no money to be made where's the money going to come from so like why is anybody incentivized to do weird betting stuff uh betting is in a weird place as it comes to pertains to sports culture nationally though it's 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 not going to be coming to ultimate anytime soon we are we already lost yeah. the uh golden goose of audl betting um and so i can tell you how it affected ultimate then it was a cash cow softest <laughs> lines ever but it's gone i don't expect it to come back anytime soon um Anyway, I'm excited because the next couple rounds of March Madness are going to be fantastic. Like, you know, we're, we're already getting the trash talk going. All Basically, all the good teams advanced in the women's tournament. So now we get down to business here as we have the actual like 2-3 and 1-4 matchups. Um, it's going to be awesome. So let's see. We got we got a lot to do today. Uh, we it, it feels like it's been a really long time since we got the world's rosters for Team USA release because it basically happened an hour after our show last week. But we now get a chance to react to those, um, and we will get to that. But first, it's time for our trivia question of the week. All right, this week's trivia question. We're going to New England to talk about uh, talk about the, the teams that have gone from New England to represent the region at D1 Nationals. Simple question here. Since the redraw, 
which teams have represented New England at D1 Nationals? I believe there are nine teams across men's and women's division at D1 that have gone on to Nationals uh, in the modern era of College Ultimate. Some of these, I think, will be layups for you, Charlie, but uh, we'll see if you can get the hard ones. Uh, okay. Nine teams. Let's get. Let's go. Uh, Vermont. Tufts. Yep. Dartmouth. Brown. Um, Massachusetts. Since the redraw. Since the redraw, Harvard. Um, that's six. You got okay, three left. Second. Give me a second. I got to think through my states, my options. Um, um, no, that's Metro East. Sorry. Hang on. I'm trying to say SUNY Binghamton, but that's not right. That's Metro East. Northeastern. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a recent one. I, was, I figured you get there. So you got two left, and that these are these are the harder ones. Are they the harder ones? I think okay. so. I so what Charlie? I'm gonna you, keep you thinking think about it. Yeah. You think about it, and, uh, and no. we'll take a little bit of a break, but let let you marinate on it uh, as well as uh, our audience to figure out what they want to do. And we'll take a brief moment to talk about Sunset Lake CBD. Now they are a majority employee owned hemp farm located right outside of Burlington, Vermont. And before they started growing hemp, they were growing. Uh, they're making ice cr uh, cream for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So uh, you know they know about good stuff. Uh, as farmers, they believe in providing only top shelf CBD and hemp at fair prices, and they cut out the middleman, ship that CBD straight from their farm to your door, uh, save you on prices and, and all that drama. Uh, now, there's a wide range of products that you can use from Sunset Lakes, uh, and I've been enjoying these Focus gummies lately. Uh, give me a little extra boost. I, I am I am neurodivergent, as as we say these days. Uh, I have ADHD, and so a little extra focus can go a long way for me during my workday. And uh, so I pop a few of the the CBD focus gummies in, uh, and it helps make sure that I got a, a laser sharp eye on getting stuff done and getting my projects taken care of at work. Uh, and I couldn't do it. Uh, couldn't, couldn't do it without them. It's, it's a nice help, nice boost. Uh, if you want to get the Focus Gummies or any other great products that they have at Sunset Lake CBD, check them out over at sunsetlakecbd.com. And you can use our coupon code Deep Look. That's one word. You'll get twenty percent off of your order. Farmer owned, Vermont grown, Sunset Lake CBD. So, Charlie, what do you got? You got the last two? Do you think? <sighs> I'm I'm having a really hard time coming up with what might be the other ones. Um, I don't think so there's so been far any school from Canada in that region. Ottawa's gone in the Metro East. Um, so I'm trying to think like, are there other Boston area teams that I'm forgetting about? But I don't remember BC or BU being good enough to go. Um, Keith, I think I give up. All right. So Charlie got Vermont, Tufts, Northeastern, Harvard, Dartmouth, UMass, and Brown. There are two remaining that have qualified for the D1 college championships. One was in 2021. So this is a, is a tough one. Uh, they, and it was in the, uh, in the women's division. Boston University. Did qualify. Okay. I, uh, did. I, I, I don't know why I can't We're remember in the that. neighborhood. Like, who, who was on that team? Yeah, uh, why don't I remember that? Was well, so it, they, that was COVID that, that was year? the year. Yes. So Tufts didn't play. Uh, and they, they, they right. like, uh, it was a bit of a smaller, smaller regionals that year. The other team, and this I think was probably the hardest one because it's, it's a bit tricky. Middlebury. Middlebury back in 2015. No went kidding. To, it was a finalist in the region. They lost to Dartmouth in uh, in Dartmouth's first year winning the region. Middlebury went to D1 Nationals. It's not their first time. They went. They also went. Uh, they also were. They were the first team out in 2012 and 2011. They didn't qualify. It was a one bid region then. But uh, Middlebury used to be a big D1 team uh, before they started winning all these D3 championships, and uh, they've represented the region at, at the D1 level. So there you go. Epic. That's uh, I I don't I wouldn't have gotten those. I, I could have probably just guessed Middlebury because like maybe they went back in the day, which is exactly right. But I don't think I would have remembered. I just simply didn't remember BU going in 2021. 
they were like definitely the worst team there, right? Like they were, they, yes. they basically <laughs> got in because Tufts like essentially earned a bid and then didn't play in the series because of the COVID season thing. Okay. Wow. That's a great trivia question. Good, good for you. There you go. If you got those at home, um, Steve Sullivan got it. BU women fall 21 nationals, alma mater. Well done. Okay. Uh, we move along and, uh, where are we here? Uh, time to talk world's teams. Keith, we got these the U.S. national teams. There's been a lot of conversation. Uh, which which roster should we talk about first? Um, well, the, I feel like the, one of the first things you said to me when these rosters dropped, I mean, we were in your apartment together when the rosters True. came out. Uh, I feel like the first thing that you said to me was about a player who's been much discussed on Twitter on the men's division team, uh, and that's Jimmy Mickle. So I, I, why don't we start in the men's division? You know, we've there's been a lot of talk about about Jimmy, uh, and you and I had a pretty fierce fierce disagreement about where his place was. And uh, go ahead, take the stage. All right. Well, let me just run down the roster really quick, super fast. Ben Yacht, Andrews Yunkst, Eli Kearns, Chris Kotcher, Johnny Malks, Rowan McDonald, AJ Merriman, Jabron Mezer, John Nethercut, John Randolph, Cam Werner, Saul Yannick, Christian Boxley, Nathan Shampo, aka Skunk. Antoine Davis, Trent Dillon, Thomas Edmonds, Quinn Finer, Nate Goff, Matt Gutrohannis, Rafi Hayes, Malcolm Hecht, Troy Holland, and Michael Ng. Um, and, and that, of course, Keith, does not include Mr. Jimmy Mickle. He, of many U.S. national teams, uh, long considered the best player in the United States, if not the world, um, and was on the World Games team just two years ago. So... Now he doesn't make the roster of a, a a team where there's 36 slots. Now, you know, I don't know that he would have been the right fit for a mixed division spot, but for him not to get onto this open division roster, Keith, you had him as a lock in our conversation in, um, in, in what is the name of our show? Out the Back. Thank you. Uh, for our subscriber bonus segment. And I, I told you, on that show, I said he's not a lock. At this point, he's not a lock. I expect him to make the team. He's a likely for me, but he's not a lock because his defensive skill is has has dropped too much. His fitness isn't there, and I just don't quite know if he's guaranteed a spot. And clearly, not only did he, you know, not make the team, but I, it, it's kind of stunning because, you know. The, the coaching staff includes multiple pony coaches. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, this has become a huge thing because then Dylan Freechild comes out of nowhere with the burner account on Twitter and drops like the notes app, uh, Jimmy post, <laughs> uh, about, you know, how could you do this? And then there was like conversation about the coaches being bad people. I mean, it, it got honestly, a lot of the conversation about this whole team got totally out of control. Uh, I I'm still surprised, but I do think that perhaps you can make the case that if Jimmy didn't have a good tryout, which, you know, Edward Stevens came on here and said he wasn't super impressed with Jimmy's play that, you know, should he get a spot just because he's Jimmy and, and Dylan makes a good case, I think for why the answer is yes, which is that not only is he the greatest player of the generation and has been loyal to USAU and all of that, uh, but that he's still a killer on the field that you do not want to see late in the game when the game is on the line. And Dylan has personally lost at the hands of Jimmy Mickle in that amazing semifinal between Sakai and Pony back uh, in, was it 2018? Um, but I think that I just think that Jimmy, like the fitness issue is a real problem. And I think that the coaching staff has learned from the past where they took players who were like maybe a little past their prime and then ended up maybe regretting those picks. So that's where things stand. Look, I, I, I stand by my case to, to lock Jimmy. Like I think that I made a compelling case, which is not only the fact that he 
is not he is not a bad enough player. He's he's not a, an anchor in a way that would combined with both his leadership and his you know ability to do certain things really well on a team that could easily cover up for those mistakes. Like combining that with his role in USA Ultimate as a larger organization and as a a competitive organization, like as far as like national team representation, but those things combined seemed like it made it so unlikely to be cut. Like, I think that USAU would have been more likely to go, like have the coaches go to Jimmy and be like, Hey, is this the year that you want to take off? Like, I think, you know, I do think that Jimmy has struggled with injury. Uh, I think that's probably impacted his ability to be as, uh, as like explosive an athlete as possible, but obviously he loses a step. Like every, everybody does. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it, when you have a team where you can build around a player, like you can make up for his deficiencies. Like he, if he could play on the World Games team and win gold, a team where you can't do that, you basically can't cover up anybody. Everybody on yeah. the field is a target on the World Games. If he could do that and a team could win a gold medal that way, despite the quality of competition they were playing against, like I, I don't, I don't see how that squares up to me with not being able him not being able to be successful let, on this on this team let, let me uh, let me ask I'm, you a straight I'm still up surprised. question keith let me ask you a straight up question i think the comp for him on this roster is mac hecht i think that's probably who took his spot mac hecht not somebody you're playing on a d-line who's a very capable very strong thrower and like do you if it's your team do you want mac or do you want jimmy You, you, do you would say Mac over say Nethercut? Who I I think I, I just think that's lean a, more Mac. Yeah, than Nuts playing on a D line, right? Nuts playing on a D line. I just think they're he's a pretty players. good defender. Actually, people 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 don't know that Nethercut's actually a pretty good defender. And, and he's a shooter. I I just don't I don't see him as being an O line guy. May, I, I could be wrong, but he's obviously very capable of playing on an offensive line. Um from a throws perspective, I don't know. I just like I, I take take my original question, Mac or Jimmy. On this team, I like if I if I were making a world game team, I would take Mac, I think. If I were making if I were making this team, I think I'd take Jimmy. Uh, like the leadership aspect cannot be understated, I think. And mm -hmm. you know, it, Dylan spoke to it, you know, people have confidence with Jimmy there. And I don't, I buy that. I buy that that's, that's the case. I also think that like, he is such an, a singular throwing talent. I mean, I, I would, I, I have trouble imagining that there, that if you're playing offense, that Mac is going to have a bigger impact on an offensive possession than Jimmy. The question is what happens after the turn? Uh, so, you know, I, I, I get it. I don't think that Jimmy was like a lock from a pure talent standpoint, but. I do think there was enough there for for Jimmy to make the team. I mean, I will say I, without saying, they saying took, that without being a draft. They took Bo on a World Games team at a point in which he was like no longer like a very good player, and I think Jimmy's in a much better state as an offensive player than Bo was at that point in his career, and that was a World Games team, and they just took Jimmy, who was limited as a defender when he was on the World Games team, and it didn't matter. I, I, I it is surprising. There's no doubt. It's surprising. But uh, who surprises you on the upside here, Keith? I think one thing I would say is there's more specialists on this team than I would have anticipated. Um, guys like Troy Holland. Uh, they're just like a lot of defensively minded players. Maybe perhaps more than I would have expected. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the whole, looking back at my picks from our, um, from our sub bonus segment, Every single one of my locks, male matching players made the team. And most of them are on this roster. So I'm not super surprised overall. Uh, a couple of a couple of names that I might not have picked, you know, like Anders Junkst is somebody who I br br really wouldn't have expected to make this team. But, you know, again, specialist, right? He's going to just be a grinder offensive cutter. And you know what? He can get open super effectively and... He's a good continuation thrower. Like you can, you can envision how this team is going to be great. Yeah, I agree that we we were mostly right on. Like I, aside from Jimmy, all of my 
male matching player locks made the team. Um, so I, I'm with you there. Uh, there, you know, there are a couple of surprises of people who we thought might have made the team, who were in our like likely category, who did make it. Uh, players who did make it that I was a bit surprised by. I think one of the ones that we've heard some talk about and, and I agree with is Nathan Champeau. I had him on my maybe list. Uh, he's a great Same. defender. I think everybody knows that. But and so he fits that specialist mold you're talking about. The problem that I've seen with Shampoo in, in the past is that she's just loose with the disc. Uh, you know, he turns it over a lot. Uh, and maybe he can rein that in. I mean, when you're playing that's on a, a team thing. where your job is just to go out there, right, and take take the ball away, like that's yep. something he's really good at. So maybe he he fits that that mold well. So he was a bit of a surprise for me. And you're right, there are a lot of guys who you think of as defense first players, some of whom we talked about and their ability to, to be impactful in this environment. You know, you look at uh, not to say these players can't play offense, but these are guys who are known for their defense. When you look at Jabron Miser and Troy Holland, uh, you know, Antoine Davis is a guy who I think probably in, in the league club circles, probably known for his defense, even though he, he obviously can do a lot of scoring. So be interesting to see how they decide to deploy this roster, because I do think this, this, this team on the whole looks really strong defensively. Very strong. You know, it's funny in my mind. I was like, I feel like the 2016 team was better than this team. And then I went and I looked at the roster and I was like, no, this this year's team would crush that team. Um, I uh, so, some some of the players that I think were surprising besides Mickle that didn't make the team: uh, Alex Atkins, Kyle Henke, Hayden Austin, Nab, Jacques Nissen. I'm really surprised about Jacques, to be honest. I feel like he's playing at such a high level, but I guess they got their quota of uh, truck stop handlers. Yeah, they they they, they maxed out. I mean, I I, I had. Uh, Hayden Austin Nab, Alex Atkins, uh, LSB, Paul Arters. Arters was a player I think I heard really stood out at tryouts, which is not the first time. He, he also was apparently a big standout at World Games tryouts. So I was a bit surprised uh, Paul Arters didn't end up making the team. All right, well, let's move on to the mixed division None of the roster. young guys. Yeah, like we, we had that over-under on college players, and like it was way under. There are very way few college under. players on these teams. Way, way under. So we go to we go to the mixed division now. Uh, we'll run through it really quick. Lindsey McKenna, Jade McLaughlin, Kristen Pajunas, Aaron Rea, Mary Rippey, Julia Sherwood, Amber Sinecrope, Eric Taylor, Anna Thompson, Jasper Tom, Caitlin Weaver, Noah Backer, Calvin Brown, Marquez Brownlee, Ben Dameron, Dylan DeClerc, Khalif El Salam, Dina Elamelek, Carolyn Finney, Harper Garvey, Jack Hatchett, Kayla Helton, Brett Holzmeyer, and Henry Ng. And as I go through that, I got a text. I won't say who it's from. Get out of here with Kyle Henke. That's the beauty of doing a live show, Keith. Um, so anyway, there's your mixed division <laughs> roster. Uh, some of the big names from the mixed division as expected, but uh, a lot of uh, this is a really interesting. I think the most interesting roster. Well, what do you what do you make of this? So, you know, I've, I've seen some conversation uh, between social media and our discord about the lack of players with a elite mixed background. Uh, Claire Stewart had a thread on on X about uh, you know, basically like it being kind of a slap in the face to elite mixed experience. It, like, Don't it's give not me that. really a prerequisite. It's not respected. Don't give me that. Uh, and, okay. So, so I, I think that you, there is something to the idea that like not have, like, it seems like having an elite mixed background does not give you a big boost in being able to make these teams. I mean, there, there are very few of those players across his roster. Some of whom are uh, maybe even surprising us with the fact that they didn't make the team. Uh, Look, but, you know, take, take that for where you will. It, first of all, there's more mixed players on these teams now than there ever have been before. And that's probably both due to coaches wanting to take more primarily mixed division players, but it's also due to the fact that the talent level has gone up a little bit. But the fact remains that the majority of, of the best players in the United States play in the single gender divisions. This is just a simple fact, particularly among male matching players. It's just true. I don't know what to tell you. Like the reason that you're not seeing a lot of players on the men's side get onto these teams is because the talent level is lower and coaches are not going to take players just because they play mixed. It's not going to happen. They're looking for the best players. Now, sure, at, at the margin, could that be a difference maker? Of course it could. And there are players who are, you know, maybe known for their single gender play who have played mixed in the past. And I think that that's a leg up, but they're going through two days of tryouts where they have to do things like calibrate their throws, 
play in the different style and spacing that is the mixed division. And they're getting coaches are getting to see that happening. Generally, talent wins out. It's 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 always the thing that helps you make these teams. I, I to, to say it's a slap well, in the face is just it's just wrong. It's just wrong. I mean, uh, well, you had on your likelies Travis Dunn, uh, who's a uh, one of the few male matching players I think that fit this criteria. I think it's way more prevalent uh, on the female matching side. Uh, but you know, no, no Travis. D like when we're looking at, at these male matching players again, no Travis Dunn, no Caleb Denacor, no Bevon, no uh, Connor Belfield was one of my dark horses. Uh, he didn't make it. So yeah, I mean, it's no Leo Sovel Fernandez. Uh, these are players you have good elite club experience to fall back on, and and none of them made these uh, made these lists. Yeah, I mean, d don't get me wrong; like all these players are great. If you made the tryouts, you're a great player. Um, but I, I, I just I, I I don't like the idea that somehow it's unfair to the mixed division. It's like, no, it's not. Like that is, people I mean, are I, looking I, for a reason to bash these teams. All I did was watch Twitter people bashing these teams for days and days and days. When it's like, I'd like to celebrate the players that made these rosters for being great players and having great tryouts. Yeah, I, I think that there was there was definitely a lot of negativity. Uh, I wonder how much of that's kind of like it's funny because everybody's like aspiring to do this, and then as soon as the rosters come out, it's like I hate it. <laughs> uh, I, I do think that it's a little confusing, uh, but yeah, on 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 the more on the more players, I think here uh, the because some of the biggest surprises for me were players who came from the mixed division and or female matching that didn't make either of the teams that presumably would have been mixed teams. I, I agree. JJ Jesus in my locks. Uh, so did I. I had Cheryl Sue was like very close to being a lock for me. And Erica Bacon, after hearing what she did at tryouts, yep. I mean, those are three of the players that I think were the biggest surprise after what we learned about tryouts, uh, after we heard from people's impressions there, plus the the context of, of how they've been playing. Those were all three big surprises to me. Definitely, definitely. Linda Morris is a surprise as well for me. Um, you know, Jamie Erickson was on my likelies list. She's played some on, in both divisions. Um, I mean, I had Bacon and De Jesus as locks. Bacon as a lock was probably a stretch, but the way that we've seen Jenny De Jesus playing the last couple years in the mixed division, plus the fact that it sounds like she had an awesome tryout for her not to make the team was definitely surprising. Yeah, and, and same for Cheryl Sue. I mean, she had a, an awesome tryout. Uh, has been obviously one of the best tailors in the mixed division for a couple of years now. Has uh, also been strong in Western Ultimate League play. I was definitely surprised by those three. Uh, Cassie Wong, I know is probably most people know her for her time with Brute Squad, but did play uh, the mixed division last season. Uh, she is on my likelies list. Apparently, was awesome at tryouts. Was surprised she didn't make the team. Uh, and then from like my maybe's list, Aubrey Dietrich, uh, Danny Byers. These are players who also have a strong mixed background and and were you know didn't didn't end up making the cut. And so it's 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 interesting. List. I mean, there definitely are players who have mixed background who are who are playing with these teams. Uh, you know, I was I one that I was surprised by is a player who's played in in both single gender and, and mixed play effectively uh, is Amber Sinekrope. Uh Just like obviously a talented player, I I was surprised this past club season that she still had it like that. Let alone could still go out there and make the national team. I mean, she's she's experienced and obviously like has one of the best backhands like maybe of all time. Uh, is definitely a surprise for me that that they ended up taking her. Uh, you know, they take Aaron Ray, Mary Rippey. Uh, these are players who I think are a little bit off of people's radars. Uh, who are going to oh, get the chance sure. to play on this mixed team? For sure. I I mean I don't even think I considered either of those players to put onto any of my lists, including Dark Horse. So shout out to them for balling out of tryouts and and getting that spot. Um, one of my dark horses on the on the men's side was Jasper Tom. And I'm I'm not surprised that he made this team. I think you know some people are going to be like, "Well, Jasper Tom, what the heck?" But he has been playing phenomenal handler defense for multiple years at both club and the AUDL. And I think if you, if you have a if you're a really good role player and you can be like top tier at the thing that you do, you have a chance to make Team USA. And I think he's an example of that. Like Jasper Tom 
is only there to play defense, right? Like he is not a, an offensive player of of any note. No, but like like you said, they they ended up taking a, a lot of players who kind of fit that that specialist group. Uh, and Jasper Thomas definitely got the defensive chops, uh, and, and has a couple of his D line teammates to to play with there. So uh, you also gotta get on this mixed team. You get Brent Holzmeyer. I know you were in his camp, oh. uh, and he's I was gonna kind of on the a, other side of that be an argument. Absolute so there beast. you go. Brent Holzmeyer is gonna eat. I th I don't know whether they're gonna put him on O or D, but if they put him on O. This dude is going to be like a top goal scorer in the division. I'm telling you, this team is going to just shred this tournament. <laughs> it's it's very talented. <laughs> they have a lot of great players on this team. Um, some other surprises for me: Noah Backer, definitely not somebody I expected to see make one of these teams. Um, maybe that's about it, though. I'd love to see Jade McLaughlin make the team. She's been just killing it in mixed for a few years now. Yeah, I had her Keith, before we, close as first out lock, basically. But before we move on to the women's division, I just want to note there's been a couple questions in the in the chat about it already. Pony getting so many players on these teams across the two rosters. Uh, obviously, two here on the mixed team, but eight um, uh, uh, total. So six on the on the open team. So, what do you what do you think about that? Like. Does 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 Pony deserve? The, obviously, there's Pony coaching staff involved in the in 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 the open and the men's roster. Um, do you think that they should have as many players as they do? And what does it say about the fact that Pony hasn't won a title since 2018? <laughs> yeah, I think I think there was a truck stop tweet that uh like a text that leaked, uh leaked as a truck stop tweeted out themselves. Uh, about this basically like how does how does a team with one title in the past five years have all the coaches and players on the national team um so you know people are getting their getting their shots off too uh it was a great it was a great tweet. look we've it was it was very strong look we've we've done our top 25 player rankings we talked we talked to this in circles we know the people on pony are good like this is not a surprise right like who who are who is for all those who, who have that criticism, who are you arguing against right now? Like which players tell, tell, tell me some players that you think are overrated is, is Jabron overrated? Like, I, like I know Jimmy didn't make the team and there's a couple guys from pony who didn't even try out who I think probably had a pretty good shot to make the team. Uh, if they were able to play or, I mean, or J had, Jack and out. Ryan were, were absolute locks if they tried out. A healthy Sam Little's got to have a pretty good chance, right? Like John Randolph oh, yeah. was making this team. Uh, you know, they, they end up taking Harper Garvey and Antoine and Jabron. And like, maybe those are players who you would have been on the fence about. Uh, but like, who are the individual players that you think are just not that good on this team? Because uh, I, like, we've seen enough of these players playing at a high level to buy into the idea that they are elite. Uh, I know Pony's results but have not been... As good as as good as people would have hoped for, it's definitely disappointing. I'm sure that they're disappointed. You, know, you talked on Sideline Talk, our subscriber only podcast with Isaac Saul, and he kind of laid out some of the case as one of the coaches of the team. Like, it's kind of been a bad luck run for them in some ways, uh, and I think that's part of what it takes to win the title is being a bit. You have to get a little lucky. You have to stay healthy. Uh, you have to have a couple things break your way. But uh, you know, it's all right. I I, I, I get it, but I I just don't think here, that the here's players the players. Are bad. <laughs> Here's the individual players, and, and Rohan already pointed about in the chat that I think people might squint at. One is Harper. The other is Marquez. Now, you know, I saw somebody somewhere say, like, did MKBHD make it because of social media? I was like, no. First of all, Marquez is going to, he's going to be an awesome part of this team. He's a great defender. His, his skill set, I don't know if people have been paying attention, but he has gotten a lot better in the last few years playing with the Empire and Pony. He's a, an incredible puller. I would expect him to pull as many of the like men's pulls for this team. Um, and, I, you know, he, he's like, he's just, a, he's also really good after the turn. He's just a really good player. I think it's, uh, if, if you asked me three years ago, would I be surprised? Yes. But I'm not surprised after the the kind of growth we've seen from him as a player recently. Harper Harper did did feel a little a little bit like a surprise to me. But man, he's so good. It's just it's easy for him to get lost a little bit because of how 
talent rich pony is. Uh, but Harper is like a very consistent handler who somehow is also dangerous if he releases and goes downfield. Like I, he scores more upline goals than I feel like a player of his stature should be scoring in the club division. Um, I, you know, I wasn't a tryout, so I can't speak to that part of it, but I'm not shocked to see him make the team. I guess the question is like, what handler would you have taken over him on this roster? And that's where I think the, the questions always get hard. Dude's in our catch of the year bracket. He had one of the nastiest guys of the year and guys like a primarily known as a deep thrower. Like, uh, right. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the case can be, can be made. I mean, look at tr truck stop has, has a lot of players here and they had some players on the fence too, who maybe could have taken those spots from, from uh, MKBHD and, no, and Harper. No but, Tyler Monroe uh, is shocking. No Tyler Monroe is shocking. That's all I will say. Um, all right, let's move on. Women's division. Let's take a look at the roster here. Uh, Raha Mosafari, Anna Nazarov, Alyssa Perez, Lisa McKaithley, Sam Rodenberg, Claudia Tajima, Gina Tickcomb, Caroline Tornquist, Claire Trope, Juliana Worfley, Angela Zhu, Alex Barnett, Claire Chastain, Abby Chang, Don Colton, Ronnie Eater, Cami Groom, Shayla Harris, Abby Hecko, Sadie Jazerski, Sharon Lynn, Rachel Mast, Sarah Mextroth, and Kendra Miller. So there is your women's lineup. Um, I got a bunch of these right, Keith, but also got a lot wrong on this side um I, I i don't think there's any like how the hell did they not pick her players at least for me but um definitely a little bit more variance here than i expected definitely and and there's a lot of players who i think are like less reputable grinders you know on these teams you know you this team in particular you look at players like ronnie eater and kendra miller from molly brown like those are not players i think are the first on people's lips when they think of molly brown but these are players who play their ass off and have earned the respect of, of their teammates uh you, know, you look at rachel mast a player who's what been playing for like five years or something like that uh not even the gotta be the biggest surprise right like Easily the I biggest surprise any, on Rachel any of the rosters. On anybody's radar, for sure. Uh, Alyssa Perez, another Molly Brown player, who uh, the Denver people have been talking uh, them up for like two years to me. So I've heard a lot about Alyssa Perez, and now uh, they're they're on the national team. So uh, good for them, and uh, a lot of players to be excited about. But I think this was this the this roster to me was the most surprising, not only with the inclusions but some of the exclusions as well. Uh, there were a lot of players on my likely list who ended up not making it, who I think would have been a fit on this roster. Yeah, uh, that's true. I mean, same here. I already mentioned a couple of misses. I mean, I had, I had Leon Hoffman as a lock. She didn't make the team. Um, a bunch of likelies that didn't make the team, like Danielle Byers, Avi Dietrich, Bridget Meisner. Uh, I already mentioned Linda Morris, Tori Gray, who apparently had an amazing tryout, but then didn't make the team. Uh, but you know what? They just didn't take a lot of college players, Keith. The, Emma just pointed it out in the chat. Only four current college players made it. Um, 11 and a half, which was the line that we got, what I, that I gave was uh, obviously a little bit too high. <laughs> no, yeah. The, 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 yeah, I, I, I mentioned Cassie Wong. Uh, Alika Johnston was another one that was a surprise for me. I also had Hoffman as a lock. Linda Morse. Maggie O'Connor, uh, another player who I think seemed like had a yep. standout tryout, and I thought, uh, would have made it, uh, Aaron Schrader. Um, you know, we, and there's, there's a, there's a lot of those players. I didn't get a single dark horse this year, not a single one, uh, which was disappointing to, to not hit on any Blaise Sevier. I, like I wasn't even sure she could count as a dark horse and then she doesn't even make the team after how she played this club yeah. season. I would have thought, Oh my gosh, had a great shot. Ellie youngst. Like there are a lot of good players who obviously, there was there was literally just not enough space. Like you could, it, it would have been impossible for there to not be good players who made this team. You know, like vice versa. So like it, it this that's the situation here. But uh, exciting group. Surprised to see Raha playing in the women's division. I know uh, that was curious to me. But uh, hold it down. Yeah, you know, it, some, some of the vet yeah. grizzled vets. Mad Dog. Um, yeah, I had Caroline Tornquist as a uh, dark horse, but it's it's a questionable dark horse selection if I'm being perfectly honest <laughs> with you. Um, there, there's a lot of, lot of strong throwing talent. How about the you know Sadie Jazerski making this team after that year? She didn't make U24. You remember that? 
That was so crazy. I did. But yeah, didn't, I mean, didn't get a well, tryout. This, was, this she, was she, awesome. She didn't get a tryout, and then they invited her late. <laughs> some some killer defenders on this team too. I mean, you know, you could put Cami out on defense if you want. Shayla Harris, Don Colton, Claire has been playing D line recently. Um, that you know, Worf, um, Angela. Uh, th- th- this is going to be it's going to be hard to score on this team. Yeah, and you, they've got steady hands in the backfield. You know, Alex Barnett and Nazaroff, they're going to be able to, to kind of drive drive offense. We'll see what they decide to do with Claire Chastain, uh, where, you know, players like she and, and Juliana Werfley are, are whether they're going to play more offense or defense. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, again, this is another roster with uh, a lot of great defenders, like you mentioned, uh, a lot of athleticism. Uh, you know, Sage is going to get to throw some, uh, some real moonshots to some players who can go get it. This is going to be interesting to see how everybody's role shakes out on this team. Um, so there you go. I mean, you know, for the most part, the the big names made the team. Um, and so there's not like any, I mean, Mickle is really the lone big star player that didn't make this, this roster. Um, other than that, you're kind of looking more at some of the um, second tier names that maybe could have made it and didn't. And uh, that's how it goes to tryouts. I think like, did, did, did you show the right things? Did you excel at your position? I think that's the hard part. It's like, you can be a great player, but if there's three players at your position who did better than you, you might not make a roster because those players get taken in front of you. And I, I mean, I think that it looks like the coaches weighed, uh, it's unclear how much they weighed tryouts. Like our reports from tryouts seem to differ a lot from some of the evaluations. A lot of the players who have, feel like we heard had hot tryouts did not make the team. Uh, so that was a bit surprising for me, uh, but I don't know whether that speaks to a uh, difference in opinion on uh, the evaluators we had versus the USAs. But also I think that there are a lot of, players I think who are less known who made these rosters like less renowned overall and that's probably a good thing like that that the coaching staff and the evaluators are making their decisions based on what they see on the field and not 100%. necessarily just people's reputation uh so I, I think that that is a good sign because you do get a lot of players who I think you know if people were just picking who they think would have made the team I think we had a lot of players who would have fallen outside that list across all three rosters all right, we're going to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we got a little Western Ultimate League to talk about. A little Ulti World on a jersey, Northwest Challenge, and picks and preview for a big weekend in College Ultimate as we wrap up the regular season. Stay with us. This is Robin Fennig. One of the only things that we have to bring to an ultimate tournament are our cleats. And every player has a cleat story, right? Mine took place in 2022 when Noise slayed our regional rival Dragon Thrust on Universe Point in a rainy semifinal at the USA Ultimate Club Championships. In my toe case, I didn't have to change a single thing about how I cut to get open for resets. I was so lost in the moment that I didn't even know it was Universe Point when I threw the game-winning huck to Dylan DeClerc. Toke cleats are specifically designed for ultimate, with a cleat pattern for the game's sharp cuts and a durable, breathable, supportive build to keep your feet and ankles protected and comfortable for longer. That's why I've been using them for over six years. They're my best ally in the field. You put your best self on the field, so make sure you're bringing the best with you at tokeultimate.com. That's T-O-K-A-Y-Ultimate.com. Toke, sky the limits. Heads up. Breakmark now has sublimated five panel hat. You can get the hat and their famous reversible free with the purchase of one of their three piece team bundles starting at just $85. Get all the details at breakmark.com. Where's the beat? Let me hear the beat. The beat drop on this song is way too slow. Don't cut it off. Don't cut it off as we welcome you back on Deep Look. Oh, my God. There it is, finally. Uh, all right. We are back. 
Western Ultimate League week one in the books. Colorado wins at home 16-14 over Arizona. Utah gets the home win 19-17 over the Bay Area Falcons. And the San Diego Super Bloom go on the road and get the win 17-15 over Seattle in an important early matchup. Keith, uh, competitive games across the league to kick off this 2024 season. Yeah, very, very exciting matches, all, all three of these. I mean, Arizona and Colorado was like neck and neck for, I don't know, 80% of the game before Colorado broke it open like a little bit at the end. Uh, Ari Nelson was was awesome for them uh, in that game. Uh, so big, big shout out to Colorado getting the, the home win and uh, getting getting off on the right foot this season. And then Bay Area blows the lead. I mean, they were up like 10-6 in the first half. They were up like 15-12 or something late in the game. And then they, they had the disc with it tied with like 30 seconds left. And they lose the game. Uh, so they, they like turn it over like near the end zone. And then uh, the, the Utah is able to go the other way, punch it in, and Bay Area barely gets any time left on the clock. So uh, I, kind of a blown blown game for the Bay Area, uh, who I've been really high on coming into the season. So disappointing for me to see that. And then, of course, you get the clash between uh, San Diego and Seattle. And that one was pretty much close most of the way. Uh, San Diego able to, to open it up at the very end. Uh, but the very, very competitive games throughout the league, and that's a great sign for week one. Yeah, I like to see the parity. Um, does this change your opinion about any of these teams? Uh, I think it makes San Diego the clear favorite. I think it was, it, for me, it felt like a little bit of a toss-up coming into the weekend. Um, so, you know, I gave Seattle kind of home field advantage, expecting them to be able to pull it out. San Diego gets a big win on the road. I think that's going to establish them as a clear favorite in the league. No surprise there. I got to cool off on the Bay a little bit, uh, but all these games were close and probably could have gone either way. So not a ton. Like I think it's easy to overreact to the outcomes, uh, but the only thing that's clear to me right now is that that Super Bloom should be the, the favorite in the league. San Diego will play their home opener this weekend against Colorado. Uh, the Falcons will host the Tempest in a game that they're definitely going to be looking to win while they're playing at home. And Arizona will play at home against the Wild. So... You know, with a with a short amount of games, uh, you gotta you gotta get those wins, especially when you're playing at home. Uh, should be fun to watch again this weekend. Then uh, it'll be a week off for everybody, the weekend of four six four seven. So we'll get a chance to kind of catch our breath. Uh, but uh, great start to the 2024 season for the WL. Um, before we talk uh, Northwest Challenge on the men's division, how about this? Uh, Georgia State, Keith. They they lost a little bet with us last year, and we got to look at their 2024 kits. Take a look here at the uh, the jerseys they're rocking. Okay, you know Atlanta. All right, look at look look up on the look up on the shoulder right there on the left shoulder. Look, take a little zoom in. Oh, look at that, Keith. Ulti World on the jersey. Yeah. I don't remember what, how did how does it how did this come to pass? Uh so we had a bet with them. I, I think. Maybe almost uh, a year ago um, for Huck Finn because it, because it was Huck Finn, I'm pretty sure. They had to make quarters at Huck Finn, uh, and they failed to do so. This is all a follow-up to uh, being be uh, one of their one of their freshmen, uh, having a little back and forth on Twitter, uh, talking <laughs> about a little trash. Um, and then that Blossom does have a bet. Yeah, uh, and so they lost the bet, and they had to slap that uh, that old Ulti World logo on. But you know what? Uh, from what we've heard, they have yet to lose wearing the Ulti World undefeated logo. season. I'm just, I'm just saying, maybe, maybe more teams need to tap in because uh, apparently it, it helps you get Ws. They are 12 and 0. They are number 67 in the rankings. Their best win is over Cedarville. <laughs> eight to six but you know what yeah wins but, how, but wins, what logo Keith. did cedarville have on yeah that cedarville they, cedarville they rocking the ultimate world logo maybe they should have been hey they, this team's going to re, they're going to go to regionals and you never know you never know got a little extra bids going on in the southeast anything's they're, possible they're like Keith. the ballard two of of college now <laughs> <laughs> uh northwest challenge men's division uh 
took place this past weekend, and Cal Poly Slow's undefeated season comes to an end as they lose to Oregon in the final after beating them the day prior. Um, it's been a great year for Slow, but uh, Oregon kind of showed us a new level, Keith, and their offense looks fantastic this weekend as they took down the Northwest Challenge. Yeah, they, they did split with slow and ended up even on on aggregate, although it's hard to say you know, exactly what to make of uh, of their crossover game. Definitely, I would put way more weight on the final. And they also beat Colorado 15-13 in semifinals and uh, I was clearly the best team on the field from what I've heard. So uh, they're deep. You know, they they have a ton of talent. Aaron Kaplan is uh, playing awesome ultimate right now. We know they've been recruiting well. They're getting these young players in big roles. So, you know, your Raekwon Atkins, your Micah Glass, they've got some vets too. So it's not just like uh, a bunch of young guys trying to take over. Uh, they have they have Keali McCarter and uh, and those guys who kind of are, act as the leadership for that team. They're, they're dangerous. I, I, it's hard for me to quite put them, you know, into that top tier, but uh, there's, this is a team you can see as, a, as an outside pick for semis. Uh, they have the ability to beat the teams that we think are semis quality teams. And they prove that. I mean, look, look, look what a turnaround, you know, they, they, they go to Prez day about a month ago and they lose to Cal Poly by two and they lose to Colorado by seven. And then they turn around and they beat Colorado by two and they beat Cal Poly by three. I mean, that, that is a, that's a big swing. And I don't remember exactly what their player availability was back at Prez day. They might've been missing Micah glass at that tournament. If I recall correctly, but he was back playing great this weekend. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily think we saw the best of slow in that game. But I also think it's it's obvious to me now that, you know, Oregon has to be taken seriously as a, a team that could make a, make a real push. I don't really think that I felt like I'd seen that team to this point. You know, they, they'd lost the big games to the good teams from out west, right? They were 0-2 against slow. And 0 and 1 against Colorado coming into the weekend. Sure, they won the Stanford invite, but they played a super soft schedule. It wasn't a very tough tournament. Uh, and then they lose this to, to slow on, on Saturday, Northwest Challenge. And it's like, okay, well, we know what this team is. We know who they are. And then they showed us on Sunday that they have more in the tank. They're 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 a credible threat. I mean, like they are there's there's no clear best team in the West on the West right now, right? Like that like if you put slow Colorado, Oregon and, and slap them all together, like I, I'm not sure which of those three teams necessarily is going to come out on top. I, I know what will be the most likely outcome, but it, nothing's for sure with that group, I don't think. Well, shout out to uh Ultra World reporter Emmett Holton in the chat who was at Northwest Challenge, who points out that Keali McCarter was hurt at Prez Day, uh, but also mentions that Ben Horisberger played at Prez Day but did not play this weekend. So I guess the question for me is, Keith, are you like we were talking about slow as a potential title contender? Have they fallen off that level for you from what you saw this weekend? Or do you think this was just a, a bad game? Charlie, I'm, I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick to my guns here. I, I think I'm going to I got to stay a believer in slow. Uh, I think to me, this just keeps reinforcing what we know about the men's division right now, which is that nobody is so good that they can play bad and still win against against the other high quality teams. I mean, there's like a uh, that group probably goes like eight to ten deep or whatever. UNC, UMass, slow like these are probably your top title contenders right now, and none of them are so good that they can go up and beat top ten teams without playing well. Uh, now, most of the time, those teams are going to play well. They're deep, uh, they're they're talented, but it's. It is not a sure thing. So your your Colorados, your Oregon's, I mean, heck, even Carlton when they're playing really well, right? Like these are teams that could go out there and get an upset. Uh, and Pittsburgh and Georgia, like it's a deep group. Uh, buckle up for quarters. Quarters and Nationals <laughs> could be it's gonna absolutely be wild. out of control. Yeah, I, you know, here's what I would say about slow. They, they, they were a classic example of a team that needed to take a loss. And <laughs> you learn more about yourself when you lose than when you win. It's a little easier to go back and think, okay, where do we need to improve? Calvin Brown did not have a good game. Um, 
you know, they were a little inconsistent offensively. I think that, you know, do you really want to be slow going into the series undefeated? Like, sure, you might say that you do if you're slow, but I don't actually think that you do. I think that the same way, you know, we've seen UNC lose a regular season game the last couple of seasons and it not matter. Uh, this is a good thing for slow long run. I still think that when they play their A game, they are going to be really tough. Uh, I, I guess maybe I'd say I'm a little more nervous because they looked a little inconsistent throughout the entire weekend. But I know that we've seen the higher level from them. And if they bring that at Nationals, which, for instance, they did last year, they can make a real push. And I think that they're capable of beating basically everybody. It's just a question of like which version of slow will we see when we get down to the bracket at Nationals. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're we're gonna get a real sense of what they're about because they're about to try and go back to back flag cross tree uh, as they go to to Easterns this weekend. And you know, part of the part of the the reason I think to be skeptical of them has been that they've played a weaker schedule, I think, than than the yeah. other top championship contenders. And Easterns is the is the fix for that testing ground. Well, I mean, what a, what a weekend we got coming up. We've got East Coast invite with. You know, an awesome format, by the way. They're doing like scheduled match play, followed by warm up style, record first, then algorithm to decide who makes quarters. And so we're getting, for instance, UNC Vermont on the women's side right away. Um, and that, that, that we'll have two streams from that tournament. We'll have two streams from Easterns, including our showcase stream with commentary. Um, we're also streaming from Huck Finn this weekend. So if you don't have an Ulti World subscription yet, now is the time. A standard or all access subscription gets you all of the live streams from this weekend as we get ready for, uh, you know, bids to be on the line. I mean, if we want to talk about what's going on right now, Keith, how about the disaster that it was at Northwest Challenge <laughs> for the Northwest Division uh, region that is blowing it and now looking at maybe only getting one bid? And, and this is what's gross, Keith. Uh, I mean, Oregon it's... State. BYU, Washington, Utah Valley, UBC are all within seven spots of the bubble. <laughs> My God. Cue, cue the call for probabilistic rankings right now because uh, I'm, I'm sure it's it's quite noisy. But you know what? I know I know things are bad right now. I know things are, are actually terrible. Uh, <laughs> it, and it's funny that it coincides with the best team in the region like having their best weekend. Uh, so it's like, Hey, the top of the Northwest is great, but what's happening down, down below. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a world in which this is like a three or four bid region, uh, but there were always going to be not enough bids, but right now it is, it is, it's actually like in the worst case scenario as a spectator, I think, because it's like, if we end up with one bid, all of these great teams are going to probably fall at Oregon's feet. Like I need two or three bids. So there's some real drama for your, Oregon State UBC quarterfinal for your Utah versus uh, Washington quarter backdoor game or whatever. Like I need that drama, and if we lose the one bid, it's gonna suck some of the joy out. So I need a Northwest bid to come back. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's still a chance. Even second order effects or dropped games could be enough, given that they have so many teams near the cutoff right now. Uh, McGill could also have a bad weekend. They only have six games right now. They're playing at East Coast Invite against a very weak field where they're the one seed. Um, obviously, if they mop up, it's they're, they're going to lock up another bid for the Northeast, uh, the New England. But they, you know, if they have a couple close games, that could that could sink them. It's this has been a weird weird year for for Pitts, uh, and you know, like there are bubble teams in action this weekend you know so there's there's more to come on this as uh ohio state gets ready to take the field and uh minnesota like there, there there's definitely I mean, stuff yeah, wilmington the, nor the north central is it is at risk of only having one bid if minnesota that would be such a well. disappointment after the way the year started for them <laughs> i know i call i mean carlton weird weekend for them are you are you yeah, off North, to Carlton Central Hike Central Train at this point? In a, in a tough spot. Ugh. A little bit, a little bit. I like the ceiling, but there's, there's just a real lack of consistency right there that's concerning for me. 
Um, Carlton loses 11-7 in semis to Cal Poly. Colorado, as mentioned, lost 15-13 to Oregon. Uh, anything you have more to say about Carlton or Colorado in those semi spots? Uh, no, I mean, uh, they didn't really change my impression too much. I mean, Carlton's, Carlton's results on the weekend were a little concerning, um, but you know, they're also you know, traveling across the country. Getting blown out by Colorado, obviously, is, is, is a bad look. But I, I still like when things are clicking for them, it's still really good. Uh, in Colorado, like this is pretty much what I expected from them, I think. Yeah, they're, they're playing at the level that I think I expected to see. Um, all right, let's talk Easterns. Uh, it's already up on the screen and we've just we, 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 we duped our producer there into putting that up before we really got to it. Um, but you know, this is, this is the premier event in the men's division in college every year. Um, and you know, we've got, it's stacked. I mean, you, you, you look at this lineup, right? Carlton's the eight seed. Um, and you know, even down the board, right? Some of the bottom seeds of this tournament are interesting because they're bubble teams. So you've got your Penn state, your Ohio state, South Carolina, UNC Charlotte, um, you know, Wisconsin, how far the mighty have fallen coming in as the number 20 seed. Um, but you know, at the top, we've got a lot of the best teams, uh, UMass slow UNC, Georgia, Pitt, Vermont, Brown, Carlton. We get that East West connection with Cal Poly coming out. And this is, this is going to be a battle, Keith. Uh, you got to finish top two. There's no pre quarters. So top two in your five team pool, if you want to advance to the bracket, and then it's just a straight 9-11-1 bracket on Sunday. Uh, what are you thinking, Keith? Is uh, is UMass going to keep it rolling this weekend? Tough. This is this is a pretty tough pick. I mean, any of these these top four seeds are pretty convincing to me. Or maybe we finally see Brown become the team that like I feel like you've been hoping they would be. I mean, it's wild to me that they're seated behind Vermont and justifiably so at this point in the year maybe it's huntsville time maybe it's time to to uh jump on the bandwagon uh imagine they make the final at easter right like that would be that would be just like a, a, a crazy college occurrence i mean this will be an interesting tournament because the winner is going to be established as your title favorite most likely and meanwhile in consolation you're going to be deciding bids so uh there's like this two pronged effect on Sunday as the as the tiers break up into into different groups. Where am I going to go here? I mean, is it crazy to go back to UNC and say they're going to say the rebounds coming? Keith, that, I don't uh, think it's crazy yeah, got... to go back to the three straight college <laughs> champion. <laughs> Maybe they, they bounce back that. a little bit, you know they. They, they said we're, we're tired of the disrespect. We're, we're about to show everybody what's up. Uh, they're closest to home turf. I mean, just on the merits of how they're playing, I think UMass and Georgia, honestly, could be your top two uh, as of late. But, yeah, it's, it's tough. Are, are we already in the picks? Are we already at the point of making picks here? I, I'm getting there. I mean, I think what I'd say is, like, I UNC, I really like them to win their pool. Uh, you know, Brown slow for the top of pool B, I think is going to be really interesting. Uh, UMass should mop up in pool A. And then, you know, Georgia Pitt at the top of pool D. Very interesting games. Um, you know, you mentioned UAH. I mean, we haven't seen them since Queen City. It's been like a month and a half. So how, how like, have they continued to advance as a team? You know, they're in a pool where they're sitting, you know, above two teams that they should beat in Penn State and C. Charlotte. And below two teams that they should lose to in Cal Poly and Brown. Can they, you know, you could see their weekend will be very much defined by whether, you know, if they go two and two in pool play, totally to be expected. Uh, if they can sneak one of those wins against a team like Brown, that would be a monster. If they lose to Penn State, then maybe does that deflate the balloon a little bit about the hype train? Um, there's a lot of interesting storylines this weekend. But, you know, looking ahead to the bracket, um, the way it's set up right now, uh, UNC would play the, you know, theoretically the loser of Georgia Pitt in, uh, the quarterfinal. And then you'd have, uh, you know, UMass probably playing either slower Brown 
Um, I, I think all these quarter matchups are going to be awesome. And I, I think it's really hard to, to prognosticate. So I'll let you go ahead and go first. Uh, who are you taking in the finals and, <laughs> and who, are you taking it, who do you have taking it down? I think it's going to be really hard. I'll let you uh, you step on the first landmine to clear out some space for me. Thanks, thanks, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, give me, give me UAH. Let's do it. Where's Where's Kenny in the chat? He's usually to the here. final. This, this is oh, his time. Oh, baby. No, I'm, no, I'm, <laughs> no okay. I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, but Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. I think they're going to beat one of Browder slow. I do. I do. I do. I'll say that much. Brown? Uh, but it, it Brown takes a lot more than that to Looked it. a little shaky. And if Leo Gordon isn't playing, they are missing a very important part of their offense. You don't say. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, it's top I think I'm going to take. Uh, I think I'm going to take. Man, I like these top four so much. It's so. It would be so weird for Easterns to go to chalk in that way, though. But I, I like that. I like all four of these teams a lot. There's Kenny. There's Kenny in the chat. <laughs> all right, let me get um, let me get UNC over slow. So I got UNC in the final, and is, is Georgia going to beat UMass again? No, nah, I'm, I'm taking UMass. I'm give me give me UNC versus UMass, and I'm taking uh, UNC to win it. Oh my. I, I I just I don't I don't think UMass is going to do it again. I don't think they're going to do it again. I think they're going to take an L or two this weekend. You, know, you look back at Smoky Mountain; and they won all their games by like one or two goals. The variance goes against you at some point when you're playing th this this close level of parity. Uh, I think UMass loses a game; they'll they'll win their pool. I think pretty comfortably. But then you know. Uh, I, I guess I have them winning their quarter, but then probably losing their semi to whoever they play there. So if it's Georgia, um, if it's Pitt, I don't know. You know what? Pitt always plays well at Easterns. Give me Pitt in the final against UNC, and I have UNC getting back on top and retaking the number one ranking heading into the postseason. Oh, somehow we ended up with the same team winning. I hate it. I hate it. Come on. I mean, it's UNC. This is Easterns. They 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 sub they sub much more aggressively. They 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 build up to this tournament. They they take it a lot more seriously than the other tournaments. Um I I think you know, we saw last year that they can erase the the stigma of them never winning this tournament. It because if slow I would love to see slow win back, though. Playing cross country, I would I I would switch my pick. I would pick them over UNC. I don't feel like I feel like that game's kind of a coin toss. But the fact that they're playing a back-to-back -back across country is I can't I can't I can't count on that. So I, I can't pick slow. Death taxes and picking UNC. That's what we do here on Deep Look. <sighs> it's inevitable. Um, we also have the East Coast invite. Who do you think is winning that one, Keith? Well, uh, I. This is not going to come as a big shock. I'm going to be surprised if, if you can manage to get to anything else other than uh, UNC in Vermont in the final. Um, I, I guess I, I, I don't. You got to think they're going to be the top two teams in coming out of the out of the pools. So I think that should Hard see to them as to opposite sides of the bracket. Uh, yeah, you know, your top contenders aside from them, um, what Tufts? Uh, you, you, you could easily have two Penn, teams. You Penn undefeated. Michigan. And that would mean that whoever loses the UNC Vermont game in match play would be necessarily seated lower and they might meet in semis instead of finals. It's very possible. I haven't like run down every yeah. single team's spots, but it's possible. Yeah, but uh, you know, you know, it, it, it really doesn't make sense to me to go anywhere, but UNC Vermont in the, in the final, um, give me, uh, give me Vermont over UNC in the final. Okay. Uh, I think Tufts is going to win all their games in pool play or in match play. They're playing Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State, and UCLA. So I have them going 4-0, which means that they'll have a high seed probably you know, behind whoever wins the UNC Vermont game or ahead of even. And so then I guess are they... 
Like it just depends on whether you think they're going to have a higher or lower spot than I, I think to, here's my here's my my take is Tufts will get the top seed because of an easier schedule. And then UNC and Vermont will play again in semis. Whoever lost the pool play game will win that game. So give me Vermont to advance to the finals to play Tufts, and they'll beat Tufts in a uh, New England regional matchup. Charlie makes me go first and then picks the same champions as me. What's going on here? What's what's going on here? Uh <laughs> The, uh, I just I think Vermont is a bet probably a better team than UNC this season. Yeah, but they do they do have a way about them that like feels uh, like they're all, like they're playing on the on the tightrope sometimes. I hear um, that. This is this is this tournament. Can I just say this is like the most Metro East of an elite tournament ever. I mean, you got. Columbia, Cornell, Bing, and uh, <laughs> Yale, all in attendance. Ottawa was supposed to go to this tournament, and I'm so disappointed they won't because I think they could have been like a dark horse team to come out of the Metro East. Or Ottawa might be sneaky good, uh, and I wish that they could have played in the regular season to to kind of show out and in a prep. Uh, but, you know, this this will be a good proving tournament for the likes of, of the Metro East teams, and then UPenn and Browns coming off a big, big Centex performance. So uh, there's some stuff to watch down the line, but... You just have you have like a tier of teams that are thinking about semifinals and then a tier of teams that are like trying to get to nationals. That's right. That's right. Um our our uh, producer Lindsay Sue says in our private internal chat, UNC loses one game and y'all pull the plug. That's crazy. What do you think, Keith? Are we crazy not to pick UNC here? Uh I look, I I thought about it, but I know it's 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 funny to say like oh UNC loses one game and like that's the end of it but they they you know that i guess that carlton team's also beaten vermont pretty handily but vermont's beaten ubc like uh, this is not some slouch team we're talking about crazy not slouch upset, team. like has no yeah so i don't feel bad about i have it. them splitting their matchups for what it's worth i have unc winning and on saturday and losing on sunday it's, it's the, i i feel the same i feel the same <laughs> Oh my. So it's going to be fun. We got a lot of, you know, we'll have to see if Cody Mills runs the Frisbee rankings on Saturday night so we can see where things stand in the bid picture. Any notes on the women's bid picture, Keith? Uh, you know, let's take a, Sixth let's take a look at uh, Northwest. Uh, Hoo -ah. Yeah. The Northwest, the, the evil empires is, is what people have, have been talking about. I mean, they, it's, they, it's not just the Northwest. We are back in, Basically every strength bid is going to a west a western region right yeah. now. The southwest ten, is four ten bids. total bids. Ten, ten bids for bids. the west coast regions. This can't this can't this can't happen. We can't New England we can't has two. South Central has two. Everybody else has one. Is it wrong? It's terrible. It's, is it wrong? Is it is no, I mean the, a bunch of other teams have underperformed. I think that your best chance of uh of breaking things up is, is Ohio Valley. Right. But, uh, you know, great lakes, obviously tough spot for them with Notre Dame, uh, that, so that kind of hurt them. And, uh, Ohio state is just outside the big picture in the, uh, in the Ohio Valley. So maybe they can, uh, they can make a move. Uh, Penn is, we like don't know what BYU on, is going to do, bubble, but yeah, we don't know what Important BYU is going to do. If they don't play, then that's going to drop a bid down to OV. But I mean, anything. Yeah, I mean, assuming OB, the, OB can, still can hold it. Right, a lot could still change. Yeah, I mean, weekend. there's some there's some second order stuff that could that could come into play. But the the big picture in the women's division is is I feel like a little more settled looking, and uh, that stinks if you're not in the in the two regions that have all the pits. All right, it's time to get to our question of the week. What do we got, Keith? All right, uh, this week's question of the week. Um. Actually, I've I've lost our question of the week. Uh, it's 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 see. in our notes, Keith. Thomas Owen in Discord. I'll just read it. You answer it. I'll read it today. Okay, thank you. Where's it? Yeah, where uh, is it in our notes? I don't talking see about both divisions. Who is the college program in each division that has done the the least, mostly focusing on postseason results, with the most talent 
in terms of eventual or projected club success. Okay. So let, let me, let, let's be more specific about what is, what, what Thomas is asking. So he says, I'm thinking about Kentucky men's basketball over recent seasons, right? So Kentucky men's basketball, for those who don't know, they are known for bringing in the t elite prospects, top NBA prospects who are going to play one year of college and go straight to the NBA and be a first round draft pick. And, you know, they lost in the first round this year. Um, and so, you know, they, they often don't really do that great, but they also just have no continuity as a team because they turn over half their roster every year. So thinking about teams that ultimately had a lot of club players go on to great success, but didn't do much while they were in college, who has done the least with the most? That's the question, Keith. Uh, I, I mean, I know this feels like a layup, layup answer in the men's division, but it's got to be Carlton, right? Absolutely. Like, they've done a lot, but they've also missed nationals. Like sometimes with teams that seem stacked, it's, it's, it's got to be Carlton. Yeah. I mean, they, they often have two or three of the best recruits per season. And then they're not even a consistent nationals performer. I mean, they're, they, they lose to Wisconsin, a team that is like, you know, plumbers and mechanics to use the, to the NBA <laughs> meme. Uh, like I, you know, and, and shout out to Wisconsin for like punching so far above their recruiting weight class. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Carlton is like always just the like, gifted, these amazing play. I mean, how, what's the furthest they got with Joe white? Did they even go to semis with Joe White ever? And we're talking about a guy who's probably going to be a top five player in in the club division for like ten years. When when did Joe White when did Joe White finish? Uh, somebody somebody in the chat's getting to my oh, next no. answer. By the way, <laughs> well, go ahead with your Let's next see, answer. I'll, and... I'll I'll try to look up some Carlton okay. stats. Uh. Uh, Washington is uh, there's a connection here, right? These are the schools where uh, Seattle Seattle players tend to go. Uh, Washington's had a number of great recruited teams, a number of teams that had like they get some good grad students that come in, guys who've gone on to, to some club success, guys who were hyped recruits. And uh, what 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 do they have to show for it? Like <laughs> Washington is has some quarterfinals exits, right? Like I, I don't know. They're a team that I feel like has as long underperformed their talent level. Uh, you know, they've they reached quarters in in three of the past six seasons, uh, but mostly other than that, you know, pre quarters runs and you know, it never really felt like a threat to make semifinals. So they're they're definitely another team that uh, feels like they're they're near the top of the list. Uh, Carlton made semis in 2018 they lost to Pitt. joe white was a freshman that year uh a big contributor for what it's worth but i mean the, you know and this team was totally stacked i mean eric taylor dylan lanier uh that, i think that was alex olson's last season uh saul yannick luke webb uh stan birdsong ethan bloodworth uh andrew roy was on that team and you know semis is is a good result uh, but it, it just feels like they've had these monster rosters that have failed to, to really materialize. And then they didn't do much at all with Joe white as the, as the kind of the, the lead guy on that team, as talented as he was. I like that. The, the pony of D one men's, uh, Emp <laughs> says, uh, low key <laughs> Texas a little bit. They've been stuck in quarters for a long time. Maybe it's not overflowing with talent, but I feel like there's lots of really good players there. Not according to the USA national team coaches. Forgot to mention that earlier, by the way. <laughs> no Texas players, once again, on the USA national team. The deep disrespect continues. We got, got to keep that Texas Texas chip on the shoulder. Um, thinking about the, I'm trying to think about the women's division. Uh, it's hard because I think that the programs that I would name still have had national success. Uh, but you know, when you're, when you're looking at like how much club success they had uh, Colorado, right? Like they, they have, they made right. What, what three finals in the past five years. Uh, but 
you know, they, they had some, they had some down years in the middle there and they always have a, have a lot of elite club talent. So maybe Colorado could be on that list. Um, uh, I know that it's all hype right now for UBC, but UBC used to feel like a team that perennially had some disappointing outings, finishing in quarters. Um, maybe UC Santa Barbara. They, they always is, have that like dynamic duo that's elite club level, but uh, you know have trouble. Is it wrong to say Carlton through the quarter line around? Maybe Carlton. Is it wrong to say I mean, Carlton's Carlton? had a pretty good run. They've let's see, they've made but so they, they haven't made quarters won. last year. But they were in semis for the three for two years prior, quarters of the year prior. But yeah, they haven't been in the like in the running for a title like in that in that those last moments until since 2013 they made the final. But like, come on, they were they were in the mix in 2021. I mean, yes, of course they were in the mix, but they, they didn't were, make the finals. They were supposed to be this UNC foil, and then they don't even get to the game to play UNC. They lose to Washington. They got echoed in 2021. <laughs> they got echoed. Heck who who heck among us has not been heckoed? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I just feel like, again, when you think about the talent that that team produces and, and sends to the club division, they do underperform, right? I, mean, I, I get it. Let, um, let, me, let me go back and look at it. Let me look at, look, let me look at a roster from Carlton from like 2018. Let's just go back a few years. Carlton didn't even make uh I think they made quarters. No, maybe they didn't even make it out of their pool in 2018. No, 2018 was their big down year. Uh that was they they didn't make the bracket that year. So maybe this is the wrong season to look up for them. Yeah, they they, they, they don't they really have in 2019. That that was not their that was not their strongest season. So let me go back in time. Let me go back to like 20 what, 2015? Uh, let's see. 2015, they were a Stemmy's team. Let's take a look at a. Let's take a look at a roster. That would would that have been like, um, you know, they had a. They had, was that like Emily Buckner and Flannery McArdle? Was that is that that is that 2015? Uh, Emily Buckner was on the roster. Lucia Childs Walker was their yeah. big thrower. Julia Snyder, uh, Megan Chavez, uh, Claire Thallon. Their big goal scorer. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what? Honestly, it's not like those are names that are knocking, blowing the doors off of the club of the club division. That's fair. So I don't know if it, I don't know if it's the right pick. I don't know if it's the right pick. But they they had a really good roster there from like nineteen to twenty two, and they kind of underperformed relative to expectations, even though they were still making it deep into the bracket. I don't know if there's a great fit in the women's division. Maybe it's a Southwest team. Maybe it's like Cal or something. I don't know. There's, I don't think there's a great fit in the women's division. All right. Well, uh, we are going to head over shortly into our discord for all of our standard and all access subscribers. You get access to the ulti world discord. Best place to talk about ultimate on the internet. And there we're going to be talking about Goldsmith Nationals and Goldsmith in general and like what is the future of Goldsmith. Uh, we had some broadcasts this weekend. Somebody asked a question in the chat earlier about uh, commentary at Goldsmith Nationals and you know why not commentary at the college tournaments this past weekend. We'll talk about that as well. So join us over in the Discord. Get yourself a subscription today at ultiworld.com slash subscribe. And that'll do it for this week's Deep Look. Thanks so much for being with us on this, wow, 90-minute show. Whew, it was a big one. Uh, college season wrapping up this weekend. Tune in for all the live streams. For Keith Rayner, I'm Charlie Eisenhut saying so long. We'll talk to you next week right here on a live edition of Deep Look, Tuesdays at noon Eastern. See you then. Get that Ulti World logo on your jersey, baby. Slow, slow can have used one. That's all, that's all, Baseball that's all season starts Thursday, Keith. Go Giants. Oh, gosh.